video lecture is going to be on secondhand smoke. Hopefully, this is the one, only one that directly applies to you. Hopefully, you are not an active smoker. But unfortunately, we cannot completely eliminate our exposure to smoke because people in society are smoking. And in a lot of cases, we just can't get away from it. So secondhand smoke is the smoke that is breathed in by people who are not smoking. So this is smoke that comes from active smokers. It gets in the environment around us that we then inhale. Some of these studies that have been done on secondhand smoking are hard to compare to each other because what is considered secondhand smoke changes from one study to another. There isn't a, a clean definition, and it can be very, very different, the levels of secondhand smoke that people are exposed to. So someone that is exposed to secondhand smoke, we refer to as a passive smoker. And so in terms of pharmacology, they are a smoker. They are inhaling smoke. However, they are not actively smoking. It's a passive smoking. And so what is determined as a passive smoker varies from one study to another. Is this someone that lives with someone who smokes? Is this someone that works in a location where people smoke? Is this someone that happens to uh, happens to be walking down the street behind someone that is smoking? It really varies in terms of intensity from one study to another. And it also really matters what is being measured. So remember the difference between side stream smoke and mainstream smoke. The side stream smoke comes sideways off the cigarette when the smoker is not inhaling. The mainstream smoke comes through the cigarette into the mouth of the smoker, but that smoker then exhales that. The side stream smoke, we said, was more toxic than the mainstream smoke. So some studies will actually look at the mainstream smoke being exhaled by smokers, and they find less effects for secondhand smoke than if they were looking at the side stream smoke. So clearly, that is a skewed study, and it's not a realistic situation. So we mentioned that passive smoker is someone who is exposed to uh, secondhand smoke. We, for terms for, of us, we are going to define a passive smoker as someone that is exposed to smoke at home or at work. And so this, these are situations where someone is going to be exposed long term. This is not I'm walking down the streets, like I said, and the person walking in front of me is smoking and I accidentally took a couple breaths of their smoke. That is in contrast to an active smoker, who is a person who's actually smoking, and a non-smoker who is not exposed to smoke at home or at work. So if I'm walking down the street and I inhale some smoke very short term from somebody, I fall into a non-smoker category. So the non-smoker does not mean that they are not exposed to any tobacco at all. It just means it is a very small amount. So here we're looking at the amount of toxins that active and passive smokers are exposed to. Now, if we go through these, there's things like nicotine, carbon dioxide, and carcinogens. Obviously, the passive smokers are going to inhale less than the active smokers because the active smokers are also passive smokers, right? They can't smoke in a place, and then when, as soon as they quit smoking the cigarette, they stop inhaling it from the atmosphere. So the active smoker gets the secondhand smoke and the mainstream smoke. So there's just no way for passive smoker to be higher. And the passive smokers are quite a bit lower. In the right-hand column, they show us the ratio between the active to the passive. And the active is a lot of times, 100 times, 10, 10-fold higher, which is good. We, I mean, pass, passive smokers, we don't want to be exposed to a lot of these things. But the passive smokers are not being exposed to insignificant amounts of these things. I mean, in terms of some of these nitrosamines, it's almost the same, or only maybe half for the formaldehyde, only a two to five-fold difference between the smokers and secondhand smokers. These are bad things. These are, these are consequential amounts that secondhand smokers are breathing in. So here, to try to get a measure of just how much tobacco smoke secondhand smokers are being exposed to, they measured cotinine in a fairly large population of non-smokers. So this is the first group. So they're not exposed to smoke at home or at work. So that is environmental tobacco smoke. That is the ETS that they're referencing here. And it's just a, a uh, bar chart. What's the word I'm looking for? Histogram. So there's just a histogram showing how many people or what percent of the population had X amount of cotinine in their bloodstream. And so we see that it's mostly on the left side. They're not exposed to a lot, but it is not zero. I mean, there's a definite peak that comes up and then trails off. And then there are even people that seemingly are not exposed to nicotine or tobacco at work or at home that gave some very surprisingly high levels of cotinine, things that are, are as high as some smokers. Now, maybe they lied about their tobacco exposure. Uh, maybe they're, they're exposed to tobacco smoke very regularly, but it's not at home or at work. Think of someone that, that may frequent a bar. If you spend a lot of time in a bar, but you are, are a customer there, Technically, you would fall into the non-smoker category, maybe, but maybe you're exposed to very, very high amounts of tobacco smoke. People that are exposed to tobacco smoke secondhand at home or at work had definitely higher cocaine levels, and then not, not surprisingly, the active smokers had much, much higher levels. However, look at the, the cocaine levels in these secondhand smokers. This is a significant amount of cocaine. They are being exposed to significant amounts of nicotine. We talked somewhat lengthy, lengthily about the effect of tobacco on the cardiovascular system. That is not confined to active smokers. This is also this also relates to secondhand smokers. We know that secondhand smokers show increased fibrinogen. This is the, the protein that causes uh, clotting in the blood. There's 
increased bad cholesterol. We, we see endothelial cell damage, the blood vessel wall damage in these secondhand smokers, increased platelets. Platelets also control blood clotting, increased inflammatory markers. There is overall inflammation in these, in these patients, and increased atherosclerosis as well in these patients. Remember, we talked quite a bit about that also. That's the, the overgrowth of the blood vessel walls that ultimately uh, blocks blood flow and can cause plaques that then break off and cause heart or brain failure. On the right, we have a graph showing the extent of atherosclerosis in a number of different populations. And so here, we have to carefully look at their little notation here. So N is a non-smoker. E is someone that is exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. And so he, in this case, this is a non-smoker is someone that does not themselves actively smoke. And so this first group, these are people who do not smoke themselves, and that, that is a negative sign, saying they're also not exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. This would be fall into our traditional non-smoker group. So this would be the control thickness of the ar arterial wall. If you look at a non-smoker that is exposed to environmental tobacco smoke, and so we would normally consider this to be that passive smoker, their arterial walls are much thicker. This P does not stand for passive smoker, the P stands for past smoker. So this is someone who used to be an active smoker who was able to quit smoking, and they are no longer exposed to secondhand smoke. So notice that their arterial walls are essentially the same thickness as the secondhand smoker. So a secondhand smoker has the same arterial defects as someone that themselves used to be a active smoker. A, a past smoker that is still exposed to secondhand smoke has even thicker arterial walls, and then a current or active smoker has the largest arterial walls. And notice that for that, for that active smoker, it is roughly twice as thick, which is a big deal. That is a big problem that's going to cause other issues. And kind of to be self-deprecating, I hope you found or found it funny or odd that I capitalized the F in fibrinogen and the C in cholesterol. I have no idea why I did that. They should not be capitalized. Related to this, the past the effect on blood, remember we said that there is a very increased risk of cardiovascular or coronary heart disease in smokers. We also see the same thing in passive smokers. Fortunately, it is not as high. The, uh, I think the number was two to three times higher in active smokers, maybe five times higher. In passive smokers, it's 25 to 30% higher. So it's a much smaller increase, but I don't know about you, I need to hedge my bets and I do not want to increase my risk of coronary heart disease for something that I did not actually do to myself. So here, on the right, we're looking at a couple graphs and looking at the effects of either the number of cigarettes that a passive smoker is exposed to or how long they have been exposed to passive smoke. So we see it's dose-dependent in both situations. The more cigarettes per day a, a passive smoker is exposed to, the higher the risk of their coronary heart disease, and also the longer someone is exposed to secondhand smoke, the greater the risk that they will develop coronary heart disease. So similar to what we, a little bit what we talked about in the last lecture in terms of smoking and pregnancy, we can measure the amount of secondhand smoke that children are exposed to. Now, children do not have the level of choice that we have as adults. If we work in a location that smokes, uh, a lot of times now that is illegal, but if we don't, then technically we, that is our choice to work there. Obviously, finding another job may not be easy to do, but a child doesn't have any choice whatsoever. If they live in a household where there is smoke, they can't leave. And so secondhand smoke is, is a problem for children, and secondhand smoke, just like any sort of toxin, is going to be a lot of time more toxic to developing the developing body, the developing mind, than it would to an adult. And so in these tables, we can look, we're looking at the nicotine and cotinine levels in children and women that are, that are smokers or passive smokers. And so we have nicotine levels in actively smoking women and nicotine levels in children of actively smoking women. We have nicotine levels in passively smoking women and their children. And we can compare that to non-smoking women and non-smoking, or children of non-smoking women. In, in general, the, the trends match what you would expect. Actively smoking women have more nicotine in their blood than passively smoking women, which have more than non-smoking women, and the children have less than the women, but the trends from smoke active to passive to non-smoking are the same. So that was for newborns. We see the same type of thing in uh, preschool age children. It's the same conclusion, so I won't, I won't waste your time going through it, but we see the same trends in those children as well. So in these children, the secondhand smoke can cause a lot of issues, including respiratory issues. So here we're looking at the risk of respiratory tract infections in children that are exposed to secondhand smoke. And they've broken it down to whether one, one parent smokes, the other smokes, or they both smoke. And we can see that in all cases, whether if a parent smokes, the child is at increased risk of, of respiratory, respiratory tract infections. Sorry, I lost, lost my point. It's almost the end of the day. So again, we see that it increases the risk of respiratory tract infection. Now, I want you to think about for a second, notice that there's a higher risk of respiratory tract infection of why if, if the mother smokes than if the father smokes. These are infants in early childhood. These are not newborns. And so most likely the effects of in utero smoke are gone now. My best guess is that 
A lot of times children spend more time around their mother. Perhaps the father spends more time outside of the household for one reason or another, and so the child may actually be exposed to less smoke if the father is smoking, because he may be smoking someplace else. And so the takeaway here is increased risk of respiratory tract infections. The details here are not incredibly important. There's also an incredibly increased risk of asthma in children that are exposed to secondhand smoke. So here we are breaking down what percent of children have either bronchial asthma, which is diagnosed asthma, or asthma wheezing. So that's the, the wheezing sound. This is a, a sign that someone may, be, may have asthma, even if they have not officially been diagnosed. And so if we look at a non-smoking household, roughly 10% of children have asthma, and roughly 20% of children have symptoms of asthma. If you look in a household where there is a small amount of tobacco use, it jumps up to roughly a third of children have asthma, and only a few extra have symptoms. So a lot of times these, these symptoms may get bad enough that they actually are going to get diagnosed. And then, just shockingly, if you look at households that have high amounts of tobacco use, so more than 15 cigarettes per day, three quarters of the children in these households have asthma, which is just mind-blowing to me. And finally, the last thing we need to talk about is the effect of secondhand smoke on otitis media. Otitis media is a middle ear infection, or which is general, sorry, it is not. It is inflammation of the middle ear that is almost always caused by a middle ear infection. This is actually the most common reason that children less than three years old go to a physician. In 46%, almost half of all children will go to a physician to be treated for otitis media. So this is not something that is specific to children exposed to tobacco smoke. However, it gets even worse in children that are. So in the table here, we see that if a child is exposed to more than 10 cigarettes per day, their odds of being treated for otitis media are roughly double than a child is exposed to less than cigarettes per day. Here, the next line is, again, another somewhat confusing line. You're comparing the, the odds of middle ear infections in children that spend their first year of life at home or outside of the home in a daycare. So I don't know about you, but I had no idea what a private creche was. Apparently, that is a technical term for a household daycare. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to show the difference between a daycare as a group setting, it's, an, it's a, maybe a company or a nonprofit or whatever it is, versus a person that has a really small daycare out of their home. But actually, they've lumped those two together. Because odds ratio is comparing the risk of a child that spends their first year at home versus at daycare, assuming that there is a smoker at home. So if they spend time at a daycare, that gets them away from the smoke for part of the day. And so the children that don't leave the household have a threefold higher risk than the children that do leave the house for part of the day. There's an increased risk of otitis media in children that are born to mothers who do not have a high school diploma. Obviously, the lack of diploma itself has no effect here. This is a correlation. Mothers that do not have a high school education are more likely to be smokers, so that's where this is coming from. And we also see a, a, a higher incidence of uh, smoking, or higher, let me back up, we see a higher incidence of going to the doctor in children that are exposed to more smoke. And so in this case, we see someone that is exposed to tobacco smoke. Let me back up. I had this, this is, I'm going to pause and come back. Okay, so I wasn't going along. So my first inclination was correct. So what this is saying is that children who had very few doctor visits tended to not have an increased risk of otitis media. If they had, the more doctor visits they had, the higher the risk that they had of having otitis media, and the, the risk of the smoking is going to increase the number of doctor visits. So that is the end of our tobacco section. We are now going, the last couple of videos are going to be on vaping, which could be very interesting to you, very interesting to me to, to create those, those lectures.